morning. Who is this Jesus guy anyway? Seems kind of important to figure out, right? We call ourselves disciples of Christ. If you look out the front, we have a sign out front, which not many of us notice, but there's a sign out there. It says Church of Christ atop it. We call ourselves disciples. We even call ourselves Christians. And yet, how would we explain Jesus to people? Mike is going through a sermon series on the book of Luke and and, uh, lessons he would use for evangelistic purposes. I'm not exactly adding to that, although the first one he did was Luke 1, and the next one he'll do next week is theoretically Luke 4. So I'll kind of hop in there, and I'll ask you to go to Luke 3. This is not part of the series, but it might help you to explain and expound upon some ideas. Because what Luke does, before he even gets to Jesus, before he looks at Jesus' teachings, which are wonderful, and his actions, which are amazing, before he even gets there, Luke just defines Jesus for us in three different ways. He looks at historical witness, and he tries to explain to you who Christ is without even touching the person himself, right at the outset of his ministry. It's covered, and it's covered in three simple ways that we'll kind of look at this morning. If you would, in Luke chapter 3, go down to verse 23. An odd place to start, but we're going to read this section. Luke 3, starting in verse 23. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years old, being, or as was commonly held, the son of Joseph, son of Eli, the son of Methat, the son of Levi, son of Melchi, of Janai, of Joseph, of Mattathias, of Amos, of Nahum, of Hesli, of Nagai, of Math, of Mattathias, again, of Simeon, of Joseph, of Jodah, of Joannan, of Resa, of Zerubbabel, of Shealtiel, of Neri, of Melchi, of Adi, of Kosem, of Elmadam, of Ur, of Joshua, of Eleazar, of Joram, of Mattathat, of Levi, of Simeon, of Judah, of Joseph, of Jonam, of Eliakim, of Malaya, of Mena, of Mattath- Mattatha, sorry, of Nathan, of David. This is down in verse 32. Son of Jesse, son of Obed, of Boaz, of Salmon, of Nashon, of Aminadab, of Admon, of Ram, of Hezron, of Perez, of Judah, of Jacob, of Isaac, of Abraham, of Terah, of Nahor, of Serug, of Ru, of Peleg, of Heber, of Shelah, of Kainan, of Arpaxed, of Shem, of Noah, of Lamech, of Methuselah, of Enoch, of Jared, of Mahaliel, of Kainan, of Enosh, of Seth, and the son of Adam, and he is the son of God. What a boring way to start out a sermon, right? What does that prove other than I can probably mispronounce the names of Hebrew people throughout history? What does it mean? Firstly, what I think Luke wants us to see is when we talk about Jesus, we have to go back to the very basics, and that is to note that first of all, Jesus is a human being. We're talking 2,000 years now. About 2,000 years, if Jesus died in 30 or 33, we're round about two millennia after he came to earth, after he left earth, that is. You know who else existed 2,000 years ago? Theoretically, Achilles existed, or Hercules, or whatever Greek legend you want to talk about. What if Jesus is just another legend or a myth? Is he just an idea that some people fabricated and came up with that they added in and they wrote some books about him and then kind of threw him in along with everyone else? No. You know how I know that? Because there's history that backs him up. And when you look at the history, you see that history witnesses to who Jesus is. The Jews were very specific about their genealogy because it means everything to them. It really ends up fitting their system. If you can't prove that you're related to Abraham, are you really Jewish? There were Samaritans in the New Testament who were half Jew and half not. And they were considered unclean, even the worst of people, because they couldn't trace their genealogy back purely to Abraham. If you're not fully Jewish, you wouldn't be part of the old law. And so they kept very detailed records, detailing exactly who everyone is and how you're related to whom and whatever else. You see, Jesus, as you track backwards 
through the time. Jesus, he was supposed to be the son of Joseph, as you know, the, the whole story in the first couple of chapters kind of is difficult to explain. History talks about Jesus being the son of Joseph, and you go back, and you look, and you can track Joseph all the way back to Adam. Jesus is related to Adam. How? I can prove it. I can show you. You want to go to the, some records? You want to go to history? Jesus is a real human being. There can't be doubt thrust on that. There can't be doubt about that. Jesus is a real person. He existed, really. He lived a real life. He's not a fake individual who's just made up for the sake of a good story. I'm going to talk about who Jesus is. Firstly, you go to history that tells us that he was a real person. And if that doesn't convince you, if history itself doesn't bear up under your investigation, maybe you should try asking his mother. I'm pretty sure she was aware that he was a human. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. In Matthew chapter 1, you have a genealogy in those first 17 verses. Same kind of proof. Uh, that's the genealogy of one of his parents. Luke is the other one. So they're slightly different, but they both track back all the way to Adam. You look at his parents. His mother witnesses to him in Matthew chapter 1. There's this story in which she tells all the details of, his, of giving birth to him. It's a normal human birth. It was unpleasant, just like a normal one is. And guess what? His mom was around, and Luke questioned her. In Luke chapter 2, you'll see evidence of that. In Luke chapter 2, specifically in verse 19 and 51, you have certain phrases that talk about Mary treasuring all of these things in her heart. How do you know what's in someone's heart? You got to ask them. And we know from Acts that Mary was active in the early church. When Luke claims to investigate and talk to key eyewitnesses, then he talks about stuff that someone specific is thinking. He's interviewed Jesus' mother. She says that he's a human. She also says that he's more than that, but she says that he's a human. And if that's not enough for you, go ask his apostles. The most interesting witness to this is probably in John chapter 20. If you remember in that chapter, in John chapter 20, in verse 19, we have the story of Jesus appearing after his resurrection, Jesus appearing to his disciples. In John chapter 20 and verse 19. Now, when it was evening on that day, that is the first day of the week, and the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to the fear of the Jews. Why were they afraid? Because the Jews had killed Jesus and they knew that their master and their friend was dead. Why? Because he's just another guy. They've lived with him for the past three years. These guys knew Jesus like nobody else did. And they watched him as he ate, like a normal human being. And they watched him as he slept, because he needed rest. You know what? Like other human beings do. And they watched him, because he is just a human. They knew that he was dead. So what happens when Jesus comes and stands in their midst? And he says, peace be to you. You know what happens? The ones who are there doubt him until they put their hands in the physical places that he was injured, and then they know for sure. Except Thomas, who wasn't there the first time, doubting Thomas, we call him, as unfair a moniker as that might be. Thomas, one of the 12 in verse 24, he wasn't with them when Jesus came. And so the other 11 start telling stories, hey, Jesus came and appeared to us. Well, no, he didn't. He's just a human. He's dead. There's no way that he's back. Because he is just a man. When you look at history, you can find a record of who Jesus is. When you talk to his mom, you can tell that he was just a human like all the rest of us are. When you talk to his best friends, they were around him all the time. And they know he's just a human like the rest of us. But there's more. And there's something that sets him apart from everyone else. First thing when, when you're doing, when you're thinking about Jesus, you have to realize he's a human being. He is real. He's a record of history. And that means that history is based on something. Something incredible. Because there's a lot of stuff that happens in history about Jesus that really can't be explained in an earthly way. Stuff that might indicate, for instance, that Jesus is not merely human, but he is also God. Go back to Luke chapter 3, 
That's where it will be centered. All these three ideas come from here. Luke chapter 3, go back to verse 21, right before the genealogy section. In this context, John the Baptist, who's Jesus's cousin, has been preaching a bit. He's gathered quite a following. He's by the Jordan River and baptizing many people. My mic not working. Sorry, I'll try to stick right here. John the Baptist has been, you know, baptizing many people. That's what his uh, name suggests. And as these people are coming to him, he's got crowds and crowds, hundreds, thousands of people. I don't know. We're not given a count. But what happens in Luke chapter 3 in verse 21, when all the people are being baptized, that is in this very public place, the Jordan River, Jesus also is baptized. This is the first thing Jesus does, by the way. He's baptized, and while he was praying, heaven itself was opened, and the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Well, okay. You take a look at history, you take a look at all of these, these eyewitnesses to this event, and what do they all say? They say that God himself has witnessed to Jesus, but not just to Jesus being a human being, to Jesus being more than a human being. In fact, what you have is a voice speaking out of heaven, and this is in the days before PA systems. It's not just a, a public service announcement. This is in the days where nothing of that kind is even heard of, and suddenly a loud voice speaks from above and says, this is my son. Hundreds, thousands of people, maybe, witnessing to this idea. How many of those did Luke talk to? I don't know. But there are a lot of people who heard this. Jesus is not merely a man. He is something more than a man, as a voice speaks and everyone around him knows that's no human. God himself is bearing witness here. But maybe it's just a trick, an auditory hallucination, as it were. Maybe it is. Okay, fine. Then how do you explain all the miracles of Jesus? Go to Mark chapter 2, the most striking picture of this. In Mark chapter 2, it's the story of the paralyzed man. It's a classic example in those first few verses. Jesus comes back to Capernaum. He's sitting in a house. He's teaching, and great crowds are gathering around him. And what happens? There are some people who have heard about Jesus and have heard that he can do incredible things. We might call them miracles today, miraculous healings of God. And they know they have a paralyzed friend who really needs some help. And so they grab this paralyzed guy, they grab his bed, and they carry him to Jesus, but they can't get to him. There are so many people around, and so what do they do? They climb on the roof, disassemble the roof, which was easier in those days than it is in our days, so hopefully not too much property damage, and they let this man down. They drop him in front of Jesus. What does Jesus say when he sees the paralyzed man? Mark chapter 2 in verse 5. And Jesus, when he saw their faith, the faith of the friends, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, congratulations, but that's not what I was looking for. That's not the point, right? Why won't Jesus heal the physical side of things? Firstly, the spiritual is more important than the physical. But Jesus submits this idea that he can heal spiritual damage that no one else can. What does that mean? You know, the scribes got it. In verse six, what do you think Jesus is saying when he says your sins are forgiven? In verse six, some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking it over in their hearts. Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? And Jesus, aware in his spirit, that they were thinking that way within themselves, said to them, why are you thinking about these things? in your heart. Which one's easier? To look at this paralyzed man and say, your sins are forgiven, that's something you can't corroborate. That's something that you just have to take on faith. Maybe they're forgiven, maybe they're not. There's no physical evidence either way. Is it easier to say that one? Or is it easier to say, get up and take up your pallet and walk? So that you may believe that the son of man, this human being, that's Jesus's title for himself, son of man, so that you may believe that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He looks at the paralyzed man. I say to you, get up, 
pick up your pallet and go home. And he does. How many people are in that house and are looking in from the outside and see a paralyzed man lowered down from the ceiling and walk out? How many people had to step out of the way for the paralyzed man to get his pallet out the door? How many witnesses are there to these things of Jesus? See, he makes a claim to be God. I can forgive sins. And then he provides a physical witness as well. There's an audio witness that God speaks about Jesus being God. There's a video witness that God shows Jesus is God by means of the miracles. And even when you just think about the character of Jesus, there is ample witness of who he is. In John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, this is written by John the Apostle, not John the Baptist, two different people. In John chapter 1, this is written by an older apostle, as he's reflecting back on Jesus and who he was, as he ref he's reflecting back on his best friend, essentially, and just thinking. And, you know, we have a tendency to emphasize people's flaws. We have a tendency to see the negative in people, especially guys when they're joking around with each other, always riffing on each other and making fun. And, you know, this thing wasn't really a problem, but I'm going to play it up like it was. When John reflects back on Jesus, none of that's there. When John reflects back on Jesus, how does he start his gospel? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and he ends up creating everything. Drop down to verse 9. Now this was the true light that came into the world. Coming into the world, it enlightens every person. He was in the world. The world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. Jesus, the word, the light, he came to his own in verse 11, but his own people didn't accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be children of God. The word became flesh, verse 14. It dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testified about him calling out, saying, this is he of who it is said, he who is coming after me is my superior, because he existed before me. And there's so much more we can just unpack in that chapter. Point being, when John reflects back on Jesus, there's no doubt in his mind about who he is. Anyone reflecting on the character of Jesus, anyone reflecting on the things he said and the things he did, Anyone reflecting on those claims that he made that he is the son of God that he can back up with substantial evidence. When they take a step back, when you think about who Jesus is, who is he? It's apparent to everyone that he's not just a human being. The word of God manifest in the beginning. Why is Jesus so wise? Why do his teachings ring so true? True enough that people outside of Christianity, outside of Judaism, outside of even modern, uh, the, the ethical systems based off of those, why is it they can connect with the words of Jesus? It's because it's true. And it's true from the beginning. And it always has been that Jesus is God. And everyone knows it. When they're thinking about him, he's not just human, he's God too. He's given you proof many different ways. He's witnessed it himself and everything that God's ever given him. The humans around him know it. He is human, but he's also God. And I don't know how that works either. But that's what he says. And so that's how it is. And if that's the case, the natural extension of those two ideas takes us back to Luke 3 and rewind just a few verses because what John talks about John the Baptist in Luke 3, what he speaks about is the fact that Jesus is going to be the judge of everyone. He's man, he's God, and that means he's in charge of deciding people's fates. In verse 15 of Luke chapter 3, there are people in a state of expectation, but they're thinking that John might be the Christ. They're waiting for Christ, a mysterious God-man from the Old Testament, who's going to come and who's going to deliver his people. And they're wondering, John is bringing this new teaching. Could it be that John is the Christ? 
Here's what John says in verse 16, like we had in our scripture reading a few minutes ago. John responded to them all, saying, as for me, look, I baptized you with water. That's cool. But he who is coming is much mightier than I. I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does that mean? Many people are confused as to what that means. You know what that means? John does a physical baptism, which is all well and good. Physical baptism is required. It's part of the covenant that God has established. Baptism in water to forgive your sins and to remove those things. But Jesus is a lot bigger than that. Jesus didn't come physically baptizing people. He came with a different judgment, a baptism of the Spirit being salvation or fire bringing destruction. Look at verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You have here a picture of salvation and destruction. You have here a difference between these two things, that there is wheat that is good, that you can use as a, as a worthwhile resource, and then you have chaff, which is worthless, that ultimately needs to be destroyed and removed. Jesus comes in. Here's the promise. Here's what Christ is going to do. The God-man will appear, takes out his winnowing fork, a farming implement that helps to separate good from bad, and you take the weed and you store it. You'll use that later. And you take the chaff and you destroy it because there is no purpose for it. It's interesting that that picture is what's called the gospel of God. In verse 18, verse 18 is weird and we don't often talk about it, but it's tacked on at the end there. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. That's the gospel that Jesus is coming, that Jesus is a judge, and that his words and actions will divide people. When you think about what he said, he says a lot of hard things to the extent that people walk away from him. All of his followers, except his disciples, except most of his disciples, but Judas even leaves as well. Jesus said and did some very difficult things. He says himself, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to divide people. And as a result, spouses are going to fight. And parents are going to fight against children. And siblings are going to fight against each other. Why? Because you're not going to agree. Because Jesus came to divide. He came to make judgments between people. Based on his words and his actions, he will judge between good and evil. But it's more than just that. It's also based on the things that you say and do. Jesus himself, when he's talking about this in Matthew 25, provides a striking illustration of what the judgment is going to look like in the last day. In Matthew 25, you have three different parables, the parable of the virgins, the parable of the talents, and then this story concerned with the final judgment. And what does he talk about? He talks about himself as he comes down and he judges between the sheep and the goats, the good and the bad And he makes those distinctions. Matthew 25 in verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. Just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. That's judgment. A distinction that's made between two groups of people. But why? What is that distinction made for? Read on in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, those are the the sheep, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. A stranger you invited me in, naked and you clothed me, sick and you visited me, in prison and you came to me. It's based on your actions. What did you say? What did you do? How did you live your life? When Jesus is asked how he's going to make judgments, it's based on the things that you do. Lord, when did we see that? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you in any of those situations? In verse 40, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these brothers or sisters, you did it to me. How do you act? 
How do you live? What do you live by? What, what's your code? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? That's going to determine where you end up. It's not just Jesus' words and actions that divide people and the people who follow and who don't. It's your words and your actions dividing you into true followers or not. And thirdly, just to round things out, I'll throw out this idea that Paul, a later apostle of Jesus, also promises these same ideas. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verses 6 through 10, he throws out these ideas as well. Being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. There's a distinction. You can be home in the body and absent from the Lord, or you can be home with the Lord and absent in the body. We walk by faith and not by sight. In verse 8, we are of good courage. We prefer to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we have it as our ambition, what? To live in the right way, whether at home or absent from him, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds, done through the body, in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. Here Paul really specifies things. It's not just about the figures of wheat and chaff and the pictures of sheep and goats. No, it's about good and evil. It's about your actions done in the body, because everything that you do is going to be counted to you on that last day. Jesus is in charge of making a distinction between what is good and what is evil. Jesus is in charge of making the distinction between those who walk by faith and those who walk by sight. There are people who find their home in the body and they ignore the Lord. They're absent from him. There are people who find their home in the Lord and so they long to be absent from the body. Which one are you? Your actions determine where you fall on that scale. And at the end of time, Jesus is going to be the judge to decide between good and evil, sheep and goats, wheat and chaff. When Luke is introducing Jesus, this is the first picture of Jesus that you see. We went through them in backwards chronological order, but when you read Luke 3, this one comes first. Jesus is the judge. That's the primary picture. That's what the gospel is based on. But how could good news be based on that? And that's the last question I want to consider this morning. Is it really fair that that's how God set up the system? How is it good news to know that some random guy 2,000 years ago is going to be in charge of your eternal destiny? How is that good news? In what way is that gospel or something that I should be thankful for? You know why? It's because of those two very pictures we talked about. That firstly, Jesus is God, and that means that he is infallible. That means that he is always right. That means that he knows everything. He's not going to miss some detail. He's not going to look at your actions and ignore what's going on in your heart. He knows everything about you. What happens when we try to do something good and mess it up? Jesus knows. He's God. He's aware. Perfect, all-knowing the infallible one, but he's not just God. He's also man, and that means that he is understanding in a way that God the Father can't be because he's lived the human experience. Isn't that the entire book of Hebrews? Pretty much. We've got a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who can empathize with us because he was tested in all things too. Because he was a human just like the rest of us. And he understands what it's like to be tempted. And he understands what it's like to go through these trials. And he understands what it's like when Satan's waiting to get you. Because he's been human as well. What you need to realize about Jesus is he's the only one who could possibly be the judge. Where do you want your eternal judgment to come from. A human judge, oh, they do their best, but they're fallible. They don't always get things right. They just don't have the full picture. They don't know everything. They're not in charge. They're not that big. Humans could judge you, but where would we go if I was judged by all the humans in the world?
Alternately, you could have God the Father judge you, which would be much better. He knows everything, but he's also perfect. And he's also unable to empathize with you because he's never been tempted. He's never been tried. He doesn't know what it's like to live in his own creation. He's got a theoretical book knowledge of it, right? He created it. He knows what it's like, but he's never lived it. That's why Jesus rides that middle line. He is perfect as God is, but he has the experience like people do. He's the only one who could be the judge. And that's really good news for us. If Jesus isn't the judge, who is? I don't know, but I don't want to experience it. But the good news is you have a judge, perfect God, who came down in the flesh to live life as a human so that he could experience what you experience, so that he could know how you feel and how you think and how everything works and he could live that human life. He came to help. He sacrificed his position as God in order to take on a human form. That must be incredibly unpleasant. And yet he did. He did it so that he could help. So that in the end, he could give his body and blood for you and take you home to eternity with him. Jesus, when he's introduced, he's a human. He's a human like the rest of us. You can prove that he exists, but he is God. He's bigger than the rest of us. There's more going on. He has more important message than the rest of us do. He's the judge. He's in charge of your fate one day. He's in charge of where you go when you die. He's in charge of coming back and determining when that is. And ultimately, he's been divine. He's been human as well. And he knows exactly how to judge in the perfect ways. Question is, do you want to take his offer of pardon? Or do you want to face him on the judgment day? That's the question we're all asked as we live in this life, how do I want my actions to bring me to my fate? Life or death? It's very simple. Moses offered that back in the Old Testament. There's life, there's death. You pick one, and you're in charge of that fate. We're about to sing a song, an invitation song, on bended knee I come. It's about humility. It's about giving yourself to God. It's about letting him be in charge. Jesus offers that to you for you to be obedient to him. And he promises, there's a call, there's a promise as well, that if you are, he'll take you home with him. Think about those things. And if there's anything we can do to help you, I'll be standing right here as we all stand and sing this song. On bended knee I come.